These U.S. Marines are conducting an ambush training exercise. They're masking their presence by practicing ancient camouflage techniques. Painted faces, silent signals, outlines broken by cut branches. Ancient camouflage techniques help this ambush exercise to succeed. But there's something strikingly modern about this ambush that contributed greatly to its success. These Marines are wearing a new computer-generated digital camouflage uniform. This distinctive design of colors and shapes breaks up a warrior's outline in a unique way. The digital pattern of tiny green, black, and khaki squares is a collection of specks up close. But from a distance, it combines with the surrounding environment. The Marine Corps leadership fast-tracked the creation of the uniform. Move out. The project progressed from idea to initial distribution in just 18 months, the fastest uniform development in U.S. military history. Most Marines felt a change in uniform was not only necessary, but perhaps long overdue. The one the Marine Corps used for the past 20 years was made up of geometric shapes and continuous lines. Those shapes and lines attract the human eye naturally, which makes it easier to detect. It was designed during the Cold War in which the threat was a Soviet threat rolling into Europe. That threat has gone away. A Marine now can be deployed anywhere from the mountains of Afghanistan to the tropics in South America. We had to come up with a new pattern that would work in a multi-array of environments. The Army's Soldier Systems Center in Natick, Massachusetts carried out the laboratory or scientific work. Over a hundred conceptual uniform patterns were initially entered into Natick's highly developed computerized design system. The intuitive three-dimensional software program tested thousands of variables and only 25% of the time required just a few years ago for creating test designs. Once you have it in there, you can reduce the colors in the scene, you can add colors, you can cut and paste and you know, all kinds of editing features. Designs that passed the first cut were sent to one of the world's largest six-color digital inkjet printers. A revolutionary system of 64 ink nozzles per color prints a vividly detailed camouflage pattern one line at a time. Swatches for each test pattern and for each potential environment were made into prototype uniforms. The final uniform designs were ultimately narrowed to several samples. This is the desert pattern for obviously desert scenario. This here is the woodland pattern for jungles woodland areas, and these two are developmental for the urban patterns. The uniform samples were then examined by the naked eye for the two basic elements of camouflage clothing, color and pattern. Colors were tested to see if they matched the predominant colors of the surrounding environment. The shapes of the patterns were checked to see if they helped hide the contours of the body. If you have a color in the uniform that's on the edge of the uniform that's similar to the background, it'll break up that area of the outline. The infrared properties of the dyes in the uniform were also checked. There's a general principle of camouflage to provide effective near-infrared camouflage protection against being detected through night vision devices. Anti-infrared dyes in the pattern make it hard for night vision devices to focus on the uniform. At ranges of less than 100 feet, only 80% of the uniform is visible. It is completely invisible at ranges of 200 feet or more. And it's generally in terms of lightness, darkness. If something appears very, very bright in a relatively dark background, well, you haven't got the right infrared properties in, in that particular color. The next stop after Natick finished its evaluation was the Marine Scout Sniper School, where field trials were conducted by the Corps' premier experts in camouflage. When they took it out to the field to test it, some of the snipers felt that this ground shade, which they are calling coyote, needed to go redder, which would be closer to dirt, bark, 
that kind of thing. This was an original pattern we started with. Um, you can see how the colors have gone from light green to more of a coyote. The new uniform's camouflage properties passed field testing with flying colors. The uniform was immediately put into production using high-speed, advanced methods of textile manufacturing. Production of a uniform is quite complex. It's not just a matter of taking scissors and cutting it. There's a lot of automation involved. American Apparel in Selma, Alabama, offered both speed and quality control with their laser-driven, high-volume sewing machines. Uniforms were assembled five times faster and with far fewer mistakes than traditional hand methods. There is actually something very unique about this uniform that has never been done in any other uniform. Because of the pride and the heritage of the Marine Corps and the esprit, we have built in every 18 inches a small eagle globe and anchor. Modern technology produced the Marines' new uniform, but the camouflage principles behind it were learned instinctively from nature thousands of years ago. Much of our camouflage that we use today is based on our observations of nature. And very clear, nature gives us so many powerful signs. Ancient hunters were the first to read nature signs. They discovered that the colors of many animals graduated from dark on their backs to lighter shades on their undersides. This graduation tended to break up an animal's outline and even out its three-dimensional surface, making it harder to see as one object. You look at a leopard and see those spots, you go, how can he hide from anybody? But when he's moving through the grasses of savanna or out in the open, those spots blur and create a type of camouflage that hides a leopard from his intended victim. Early hunters quickly learned from the animal kingdom how to create their own deception. African tribesmen deceived their prey and their enemy by wearing bird feathers to break up their silhouettes. Native Americans disguised themselves by dressing in buffalo skins. But Native Americans also noticed that bison herds never worried about wolves. And consequently, they started wearing wolves' clothing and when hunting buffaloes, they were allowed to get very close enough to kill them. In ancient warfare, camouflage was limited to putting on cut branches and wearing colored cloth to match the environment. Galleons were painted blue by Roman sailors to match the ocean. But most ancient commanders did not use camouflage. Ancient and medieval warfare really didn't concern themselves with camouflage, and there was a major reason for that, and it was the style of warfare during the time period. The tools of war at the time had a very limited reach. As their armies rushed head on against each other, Commanders were more concerned with sorting out who belonged to which side. To determine who was who in these close-range combat fields, leaders dressed their men in showy, recognizable uniforms. It was only in the 18th century, when longer-ranged rifles were introduced, that military leaders slightly reduced the garishness of the way they dressed their soldiers. But this departure from gaudy to subdued attire was reserved mostly for scouts and snipers. Among the most famous scouts were a band of American Rangers led by Major Robert Rogers. During the French and Indian War of 1754, they were the Green Berets of Colonial America. The Colonial Woodsmen were quite adept at camouflage and stalking in the forest because of their vast hunting experience. During the war, they used the same experience against the French and Indians by wearing browns and greens, sometimes even camouflaging their faces with mud or dirt to lay in wait for the enemy. But for the rest of the 18th century and throughout the 19th century, ordinary soldiers were led into battle wearing bright uniforms and marching behind multicolored flags. While close combat dominated ground fighting during the U.S. Civil War, 
Confederate ships loaded with war materials used the colors and conditions provided by nature to conceal their movement from Union observers. These blockade runners would time their arrival at the proper tide, and the proper moon, so that all the environment was darkened. They could slip into a port without being caught by the Federal blockaders. Battlefield dress changed slightly during the Boer War between the British and Dutch settlers in South Africa in 1899. Well, the Boer War was kind of akin to the Revolutionary War. And the British, of course, had the red coats. Afrikaners fought a guerrilla-type warfare, and they just picked off the British awful easy. It was right after that war that they decided to go to an olive drab uh, uniform. The American Army also changed to a khaki uniform in 1898 while fighting its colonial war with the Spanish and the Philippines. But the rest of the world's military stuck with vivid shades of grays and greens. It would take the outbreak of a savage world war and the introduction of deadly new technologies before military leadership began to accept the idea of camouflage. Next, zebra-striped warships, reversible camouflage suits, and buildings disguised as trees. At the outbreak of World War I in 1914, most military leaders on both sides still held to the traditional view that camouflage on a large scale was unnecessary. But individual soldiers determined to survive the horror of war took matters into their own hands. No one prescribed a style of camouflage pattern for the soldiers. They evolved it based on their own experience in the trenches. Individual soldiers covered their positions with cut foliage or chicken wire stuffed with rags. They smeared mud on their clothes, faces, and weapons when going on patrol. To reduce their outline as they peeped above the trenches, a few on both sides wore helmets hand-painted in geometric patterns. Some camouflage ideas were more creative than effective. Like this reptilian painted suit that was supposed to hide snipers in trees, but instead gave the sniper's position away. Or the overgarments used to hide troops in specific environments, like this woodpile. Problem was, soldiers could never stay motionless long enough. By 1914, new technologies introduced very early in the war changed military leadership's reluctance about camouflage. Principal among the new technologies were the airplane and aerial photography. An aircraft could range uh, deep into the adversary's back areas, observe and report and identify uh, future targets. Camouflage that hid soldiers from an enemy on the ground was ineffective against this new aerial threat. Troops spotted in rear areas by aerial observers were fired upon by another new technology. Guns capable of accurately hitting targets 10 miles away. Rear echelon commanders suddenly developed a keen interest in camouflage. Allied military leaders didn't turn to a hardened warrior for advice but rather to American painter and naturalist, Abbott Thayer, best known for his images of idealized winged women. He was a well-known artist at the time, and he was also known for his interest in nature and natural things and protective coloration or concealment in nature. Combining his skill as an artist with his study of wildlife, Thayer in the early 1890s drew the same conclusions as ancient hunters. The light and dark colors and shapes of animals and birds allowed them to blend naturally into the background. Thayer's theorizing became central in creating military camouflage. The first to adopt it on a large scale were the French. Under the supervision of a fashionable Parisian portraitist named Guérin de Savola, a mobile corps traveled along the front line, disguising artillery positions, trains, and airfields. Among the 10,000 camouflage workers were a large number of artists, architects, painters, and theater set designers. In 1915, British pilots were the first to experiment with Thayer's camouflage theory of light and dark shading. 
When you're a fighter pilot, you got two goals. Shoot other people in the air and shoot the people on the ground. Well, you got to disguise yourself from both people because both people are trying to stop you from doing that. Pilots painted the bottom of their planes light blue or white to blend in with the sky, making it difficult for the enemy to see them from the ground. And they painted the top of their planes brown to look like the ground so that enemy aircraft would have a harder time seeing them from above. Camouflaging warships proved more difficult because they float on a vast empty ocean of gray, blue or green, depending on the sun. But there was an urgent need to do something. U-boats were sinking ships left and right, and the British needed some way to offer protection to their ships. Aware that totally hiding a ship in an ocean environment was impossible, Navy planners sought ways to make ships less vulnerable to attack. They started by looking at the threat. The submarine was a relatively new weapon. And so were the torpedoes they carried. They had to get in line with the target and literally aim the submarine at the target before they fired the torpedo. If they couldn't hide a ship, they thought, perhaps they might find a way to buy a little time for a targeted ship to get out of torpedo range. They picked a variance of Thayer's disruptive pattern and called it Dazzle. The purpose of Dazzle is usually to confuse the heading of the ship and confuse the type of the ship. These gaudy patterns make it very difficult to tell what type of ship it is. Each ship was painted differently in long vertical and horizontal lines and varying colors to distort the shape of the ship or the movement of the ship or where the important areas of the ship would be. As many as six or seven vivid colors were used to form many geometric shapes all jumbled together. Submarine crews were somewhat confused at first, but quickly readjusted their tactics. It wasn't all that effective, uh, but the people at the time thought they were well protected. By the end of World War I in 1918, camouflage for ships, planes, and guns had found a permanent place in modern warfare. And as the world prepared for another world war, camouflage uniforms were also considered for the first time. The Nazis, fueled by their vision of world conquest, plunged headlong into a comprehensive camouflage development program in the mid-1930s. They did reversible camouflage, they did waterproof camouflage, they had a, an Arctic camouflage they used on the Russian front, which was white on one side and, and colored on the other. In 1937, the American Army took its first serious look at the potential of camouflage uniforms. In this vintage training film, various camouflage designs are shown being tested. And while several seem to hold promise, none were put into production. American military planners focused their attention on better systems for concealing equipment. By the time the U.S. entered the Second World War in 1941, they were ready. Camouflage nets made of heavy burlap covered tents, headquarters, and even bridges. If it was standing still, it got netted. Camouflage nets were also the basic material for creating disguises. Military structures were covered by nets and false trees to look like hills. More elaborate disguises, such as making airfields and hangars appear as peaceful villages, require the added talents of artists and builders. Hiding valuable war assets from the air didn't stop in combat zones. The United States homeland was on alert almost the entire war to the potential of enemy bombers. And so there was an extensive campaign to camouflage all of the key uh, industry and government facilities in Southern California. Under what appears to be a small village nestled in rolling hills is actually the Lockheed Aircraft Factory in Burbank, California in 1942. Hollywood studio set designers and army camouflage experts worked months to hide the factory in plain sight. All the buildings in Burbank uh, had upper structures that were camouflaged. From the air, it made them look like a pasture. Whole parking lots that were not visible uh, from the air 
they looked like the primary use was for milking cows instead of uh, building the fighters that won World War II. Decoys were also used with great success. False cities, bases, and shipyards made of flimsy material that resembled actual buildings and military equipment were created in England and France. Enemy bombers routinely attacked these dummies with wasted bombs. Tanks and planes coming off the assembly lines were generally painted olive drab, which was considered the most compatible single color for blending into most environments. It would be up to the end users to apply the camouflage they felt was appropriate for the season and the terrain. Finishing touches were often added by the individual soldiers. Occasionally, the bizarre zigzag paint schemes of World War I showed up on ships. While it did little to keep ships out of harm's way, it did boost the morale of the crews. Mostly, ships of war were painted light gray or light blue. Well, blue and gray ships uh, work very well on an ocean background because those two colors are the least visible over the widest range of light conditions. The American military finally got ambitious about camouflage clothing in the early 1940s. The first two-piece camouflage uniform manufactured by the United States was worn in combat by the Marine Raiders in July of 1943 during the invasion of the New Georgia Islands. The uniform was reversible. The green side for jungle operations and the brown side for landing on beaches and moving in open terrain. But field reports gave the spotted uniform failing grades. The camouflage uniform was quite effective initially in the South Pacific. However, due to prolonged exposure to the heat and humidity, it had a tendency to bleach out. This light-colored, almost white uniform now made them stand out in the jungle background. It was quickly replaced with an olive drab uniform. A winning camouflage scheme was the white uniform, worn by both sides in the snows of Europe. The 10th Mountain Division used winter camouflage quite successfully during its campaign in the Italian mountains. In January 1945, the division, an elite group of skiers and mountain climbers, scaled the 1,500-foot vertical cliff along Riva Ridge at night to assault fortified German positions. The Americans were able to sneak up on the German defenders before being noticed, and by that time it was already too late. When World War II ended, the only U.S. camouflage uniforms to survive were Snow Whites. It would take another 20 years and a new war in Southeast Asia before the military decided to try again. Next, Tiger Stripes, counter camouflage technology, and cool desert uniforms. When American military advisors first arrived in Vietnam in the early 1960s, they were still wearing the field uniform adopted in the mid-1950s. Not wanting to be conspicuous in the jungle, they adopted the distinct uniform worn by the mercenaries working for them. The unique pattern consisted of black horizontal stripes printed over a dark and light green background. The tiger stripe uniform was an evolution from the French lizard pattern uniform worn in the Indochina War in 1953. The only other American soldiers allowed to wear tiger stripes were reconnaissance or ranger units. Soldiers wearing tiger stripes were immediately recognized as elite warriors. Tiger stripes became a fashion statement, but the uniform had a fatal flaw. These uniforms were manufactured in Southeast Asia where poor vegetable dyes were used and had a tendency to fade with use. So the more the uniforms faded, the more they actually stood out, thus making them more of a target for the Viet Cong. The massive buildup of American troops in Vietnam forced Natick Army Center to quickly produce a uniform for jungle fighting. There was no greater effort than what happened here in the 60s and 70s. Tremendous people, physicists, we had chemists, we had textile people. A lot of research went into it. A lot of trials, a lot of errors, a lot of successes. Natick's creation was a simple plain green uniform that was issued to American troops in 1967. The grunts called it a boonie suit, and from all reports, its dull color was highly effective in matching predominant colors of the jungle environment. The 
scientific work conducted by Natick in the 1960s and 70s laid the groundwork for developing the first camouflage pattern that would work in multiple environments. The result was the Woodland Uniform, first issued Army troops in 1982. Let's go, get up to the you need to move back. At the time it issued, it was the most versatile uniform pattern yet. Unlike previous attempts at dappled uniforms, the Woodland's large four-color pattern of black, brown, green, and khaki was highly successful in blending soldiers into a wooded background. Twenty years after the Woodland uniform's introduction, some wonder if its days are numbered. Okay, there is no most effective camouflage pattern. There's some that works in certain areas and others that work in other areas. None of them are 100% effective. One of the features with the Woodland was it has a lot of brown in it. It was really designed for the European scenario. The Marines have changed, and I think we, maybe it's time for us to, to improve. Natick changed another of its standard uniforms after just a few years in the field. The six-color desert uniform used during the Gulf War in 1991 contrasted too greatly with desert backgrounds. It was replaced in 1993. We were preparing to develop a new desert uniform in the late 80s. We had collected a large number of samples, as luck would have it, from Saudi Arabia. And we measured these samples, and we approximate the color of the sand in the near-infrared, as well as the visual, on fabric. It was a hit with the troops, and it was a hit with the Pentagon, with its 20 to 30 percent improvement rate over detection by the human eye. And its 30 percent increased protection from observation through night vision devices. But even as the technology of camouflage has made enormous advances over the past hundred years, so too has counter-technology for seeing through camouflage. The war against terrorism in Afghanistan illustrated this dramatically in 2002. Unmanned air vehicles equipped with thermal imaging detected the heat emitted by the warm bodies of Al-Qaeda fighters hiding in mountain caves. Low-flying B-52s finish the job with 500-pound bombs. Thermal imaging presents a picture showing the heat coming from men, machines, and other objects, whether natural or man-made. It can penetrate darkness, plain smoke, thick fog, and visual camouflage. Infrared light emitted by objects is scanned by infrared detectors. Thermal imaging creates a detailed temperature pattern called a thermogram. The thermogram is translated into electric impulses, which are sent to a signal processing unit. That information is converted into data and displayed on a video screen. Since the United States is not the only nation that has electronic imaging equipment, countermeasures against detection by use of this equipment have been developed. The Abrams tank fires off a heavy cloud of smoke that blocks the path of light imparting a sort of invisibility to whatever is behind the smoke screen. To reduce the thermal emission created by engine exhausts, some modern ships cool them by passing them through seawater before they're expelled. Some Abrams tanks have a similar cooling system to hide the heat of their exhaust. Excess heat from the F-22's twin engines is dissipated by honeycombed baffles over the exhaust outtakes. Also considered when the F-22 was designed was old-fashioned visual camouflage. I'd say the F-22 has one of the most sophisticated visual camouflage schemes yet. It may not look that way, but if you look closely at it, you will see the various shades of light and dark gray, which are computer-enhanced and designed for the primary environment that the F-22 operates in, the air-to-air -air fighter arena. Hiding from today's counter-camouflage measures requires military forces to think past visual concealment. But for a specific type of soldier, survivability is enhanced only if he stays firmly focused on keeping out of sight. Next, the deadliest military profession, compact cases for face paint, and high fashion in the woods.
snipers operate in the loneliest and the deadliest environments in warfare. For them to slip into an enemy's backyard, and more importantly, slip back out again, unscratched, they must notice everything, every breeze, every sound, every movement. Our ability to master the art of camouflage depends on our ability to hide, blend, and deceive, which determines the success of our mission and ultimately if we live or if we die. Combat snipers have survived deadly situations because they understood the value of camouflage. What they learned firsthand is still taught to Marine Scout snipers at Quantico, Virginia, and to Army snipers at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, our purpose as the instructors is to see how well a student employs camouflage techniques without being detected. Snipers are also taught that camouflage and concealment are more than just painting faces green and wearing materials that match the surrounding environment. Their mission involves stealth, being quiet, cautious, and deliberate in every movement made. Sniper schools have a crucible to test these attributes, the stalk. The purpose of a stalk is to evaluate a scout sniper's ability to eliminate a target under trained observers and survive without being detected. It is not an easy test. The student must cross a 1,000 meter long and 400 meter wide field in just four hours. Cranking up the stakes a notch or two, the sniper student must aim and fire his rifle at a stationary target. This he must do several times without being seen by cadre members. Negative. If at any time the student sniper gives his position away, either by showing a muzzle flash or making his movements easy to track, he is required to repeat parts of sniper school. Have the sniper stand up. Hey, stand up, sniper. This stalk exercise displays the sniper's talent as a marksman and his understanding of concealment. It also makes obvious something equally as important. Different ways to blend with the surroundings besides camouflage is having a relationship that is mentally and physically and spiritually connected with the environment, nature, and the surroundings. The trademark of a sniper is his camouflaged ghillie suit. The ghillie suit is a garment covered or garnished with numerous strips and strands of cloth, burlap, and other natural materials that help break up the human silhouette. Marine Corps Scout snipers make their own ghillie suits. They're not allowed to purchase them or buy them anywhere. They have to craft it and construct it from materials that they gather on their own. Handmade with string netting stuffed with rags and topped off with cut branches, the ghillie suit is the only military uniform that is anything but uniform. But then the ghillie was created by hunters, not soldiers. The ghillie suit originated from game wardens who worked on the property of 18th century Scottish landlords. Game wardens used these suits to hide themselves from poachers coming onto their landlord's property. Handcrafted from frayed, dangling rags, the suit's unique ability to break up the human silhouette didn't escape the military. The ghillie suit was first used by the military in World War I in anti-sniping activity. Ghillie suits recently returned to their roots. Hunters by the thousands are buying them for the same reason snipers use them. To hide from their prey so they can take their best shot. In 1964, the profitability of military camouflage was discovered by sportswear manufacturers. Camo clothes, boots, and weapons were put into production. Designer logos and names of non-military camo patterns are as well known in the hunting world as Versace and Armani in the world of high fashion. Tree bark by Jim Crumley, Mossy Oak by Toxy Haas, and Real Tree and Advantage by Bill Jordan. It is a fashion. These hunters are ready for these patterns, and, and you'll see when they buy the coat and pants, they go buy the gloves, the hats, the t-shirts, everything to match. Bill Jordan's Realtree is a three-dimensional camouflage pattern that works specifically in the United States and Canada. In the foreground are sharp-edged leaves and limbs. 
The middle ground is blurred foliage to simulate distance. The solid light colored background gives the patterns a neutral soft edge. Developing a pattern is very much a collaborative process. It begins with gathering samples from the environment in which the new pattern will be used. Basically, wherever people hunt, that's where we go. We try to get out there at the time of day when somebody would be hunting. We look for commonalities, trees, limbs, leaves, things that help to break up the human outline. Elements under observation are documented on film and video and brought back to the design room where they're separated and cataloged. We spend a, an enormous amount of time then weeding through images, looking for just the right leaf, just the right limb. Thousands of images are culled. The hundreds of likely images left over are then digitized. We manipulate colors, we move things around, you slide a leaf in under a branch and that doesn't work, so you put it above the branch. Pattern designs that go into production have the potential of ending up on hundreds of sports items. With our real train advantage camouflage patterns, we have over 900 licensing contracts. So anything that has to do with the outdoor environment, we can put patterns on. The process for putting camouflage patterns on hard surfaces is a revolutionary technology. Patterns are printed on water-soluble rolls of film. The film is placed on a liquid surface in an immersion tank and sprayed with a chemical activator. When the film is dissolved, the pattern remains intact in a gelatinous form. The object to be decorated is immersed in the tank and completely covered with the 3D image. Excess film residue is rinsed off and the object is air dried. The hunting industry has a big advantage over the military, whereas they're operating in one environment during one particular hunting season, we had to get a uniform that may not work perfectly in a specific environment, but works pretty darn well in a whole lot of environments. Military strategists warn that threats to global security are mounting. With that increased danger is a need for improved camouflage and counter camouflage technology. Next, future soldiers, experimental fighters, and chameleon-style camouflage. Detection and spy equipment used to see through camouflage has advanced significantly over the past few years. So too has the Pentagon's quest to develop camouflage technology that foils counter-camouflage detection. The Army has recently allowed a quick peek at what it is calling Soldier 2025. How the technology works is still very much a secret. But Soldier 2025 is like science fiction coming alive. This RoboCop look-alikes uniform is a self-powered, form-fitting, electronic and optic wonder. A primary characteristic is an outer garment that changes colors automatically. Millions of built-in microdot light-sensitive chemical sensors respond to the surroundings, changing the color of the clothes. A lot of liberty to talk about it, but I think that'll be possible in the future as electronics progress and uh, systems are developed. Soldier 2025's position will be covered by Yulcans, or Ultra Lightweight Camouflage Net System. Yulcans' colors and patterns help it blend into multiple backgrounds. And its built-in heat screening panels reduce thermal imaging by 30 to 40 percent. Soldier 2025 is also equipped to see through camouflage. He wears a sensor that gathers heat signatures. These are relayed by radio waves to thermal imaging readers at headquarters or in small spy planes. The data is converted into a verbal description that is relayed back to Soldier 2025 so that he can take appropriate action. Another way military camouflage experts are trying to thwart the power of electronic imaging is by beefing up existing smoke screens. Under development are methods of saturating the smoke with low frequency infrared light. Once perfected, the smoke screens will shield tanks and troops and maybe objects as large as ships. 
The same stealth technology that protects modern aircraft from detection has been studied to see if it could work to protect ground vehicles. Stealth is a combination of technologies and techniques to avoid detection. And that's detection in all the spectrums, whether it's radar, visual, IR, audio, or acoustic. Radar deflecting shapes similar to those found on the B-2 and F-22 were applied to an experimental truck. Initial tests showed promise, but what didn't work were the radar absorbent materials that were also tried on similar vehicles. The exact particles that worked to reflect radar waves greatly interfered with radio communications. The future of aircraft stealth technology is the X-35 fighter with its curved or rounded surface. For years, aeronautical engineers knew that the slanted angles used on previous stealth aircraft, like the F-117A, were not necessarily the best way for reflecting enemy radar. The B-2's design enjoyed partial success with its curved surfaces, but it took today's advancements in computing to bring it all together. With the advent of the computer processing that allows us to really compute for the compound curve kinds of designs, we're able now to have a, a very close synergy between aerodynamic performance and the ability to limit and reduce radar cross-section. Most camouflage experts are aware that modern technology makes it much easier for one adversary to see through another adversary's camouflage. But they're neither daunted by the challenge nor concerned with the growing idea that visual camouflage is now of secondary importance. I happen to believe that technology isn't rendering camouflage ineffective. I think we have to stay ahead of the game. And in terms of the work that we do here, we have to develop countermeasures against these detection devices as they come online. Advances in camouflage and counter camouflage will become more and more sophisticated as technology improves. But the fundamental approach will be the same one used by primitive hunters. Figure out how your opponent sees you, and then cover up all the elements that make you stick out. It will never be outdated. It's seen or be unseen without getting killed. You can't camouflage, you're gonna die basically on a battlefield. It'll never go away, it will always be here.